Well, good morning. Good morning. So we find ourselves today, this uh, second Sunday of Easter, and Max, you're right, it still feels like Easter to me around here. Uh, very, I don't know, just just the presence and the power of the risen Christ is still, still running down these hallways. And so we have an opportunity today then to learn a few more things about what happened right after Christ was risen. Because it's in those eyewitness statements, those eyewitness testimonies that were later recorded that we know that Christ actually did raise from the dead. In those passages right after uh, what Max preached from, from John last week, it's, that's the story of the empty tomb. What we can look at now, what we can look at today in the next chapter of John then, is how the risen Christ appeared to them in several ways. First of all, in that upper room, in John, at the end of John chapter 20, Christ breathes onto them in that upper room. And Christ says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed His Spirit onto them and into them and all around them so that there would be no doubt of His presence. Also, so there would be no doubt of the power that He was giving to them from His breath. In that moment, the risen Christ was flesh and blood again. Not a spirit, not a presence, not a force, not an aura, but flesh and bones. And then you all know about Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas. Lord, are you sure it's really you? Mm, there's a whole sermon right there. But anyway, you know the story of Thomas. But if we move on past that first little encounter in that upper room afterwards, and we read in John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of, De of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. And Simon P Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Right? Because that's what you do in the middle of the night after your Lord has been crucified, is you go fishing. And so they said to him, well, we're coming with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, there was Jesus standing on the beach. And yet the disciples didn't know yet that it was Jesus. And he said to them, children, you don't have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. And so they cast, and then they were able to haul it. They were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. And that disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer, outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Peter's a little dramatic always. Y'all notice that about Peter? It's a little drama there always. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish already placed on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of those fish that you've caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153 fish. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. This is a word about our risen Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So yeah, Peter, Peter, Peter says, I'm going fishing, right? First of all, it's what Peter did for a living. 
But secondly, you have to remember they were in the throes of grief and trauma. This man, Jesus, that they had followed for three and a half years had been tortured and crucified, and they knew he said he was coming back. They'd even already encountered him one time. But what they were faced with now was not having them present in their lives to lead them every single day. And so Peter actually did a brilliant thing. He probably didn't even think about it. But he handled his grief. He started processing his grief by participating in a physical activity. He went fishing. And the rest of them who went with him participated in that same physical activity to process their grief and to have fellowship with each other because sometimes when you grieve, you don't want to grieve alone. You want to be with people who can understand how you feel. Because we hold trauma in our bodies. We hold grief in our muscles, in our minds, and in our hearts, our literal hearts. And these folks, they're no different than we are. They were deeply grieving the loss of Jesus on the cross. And they were afraid for their lives. And they were very unsure of their future. And so Peter chose to move to deal with that. He chose to deal with his trauma by participating in that physical activity. Now, it was something he'd done his entire life. He wasn't going out to learn a new skill. He wasn't doing anything that required his intense con con uh, <clears throat> concentration. Sorry. <clears throat> He was doing something he'd always done, something that he could do without even thinking about it. Now, if you read this, this scripture just on the surface of it, it's just a big fish story, right? I had an aunt and uncle who, that's what they did. Every moment they got, they put a line in the water somewhere. They loved to fish. They were always fishing. And I heard some pretty grand stories about fish. But if you just look at this on the surface, that's what this is. It's just people standing around talking about what a great catch they had and how large all these fish were and how many there were. But folks, this isn't just a tall tale about catching fish, is it? Because we can't ignore the fact that the same Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified and died and was buried is now alive and walking among them. So after they worked all night fishing and didn't catch anything and they pulled up there um, next to the shore, he built them a fire, a nice, warm, welcoming fire. I can see some of you right now are feeling like you're sitting by the fire, getting ready to doze off. <laughs> and then he served them breakfast, bread and fish. Because even in resurrection, he was still at their service. Still making sure they had those things that they needed. And not only that, but he met them where they work. And they fished for a living. And to go out and fish all night and to come home with nothing, well, that's failure. Right? But he showed up there and made something grand and something amazing out of their disaster. And so as they shared that meal together on the beach that day, and the sun began to break, in those first intimate moments when the sun kisses the earth, they could forget their own heartbreak for a minute and just enjoy being with Jesus, their Lord. And I can just imagine, as they were sitting there, Jesus looked over, and he saw Peter there. Peter's probably about to fall asleep because he's been working all night, and he's exhausted. He had threw himself into the ocean. He had to swim 100 yards. And right at that moment, Jesus says to him, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Now, we don't know who Jesus was talking about. We, we don't know if Jesus was saying these other believers that are here. He could have been talking about the fish, for all we know. But he said to Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? And of course, Peter, I'm sure, sat right up. Of course I love you, Lord. And Jesus said, then tend to my sheep. And three more times, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Then tend to my sheep. Because Jesus knew he was walking with them again in flesh and blood and able to be with them. But Jesus knew, and I think they knew deep in their hearts, that that was about to change. God was no longer going to be with us in actual flesh. God was going to be with us in spirit, on a plane that we can't see. No longer God the Son, but God invisible. And Richard Rohr, you know, I read a lot of Richard Rohr. He comments on the impact of God being flesh with us and walking with them, but being invisible to us. They saw Jesus in the flesh. They could touch him. They could talk to him and see his face. And Rohr says, we only know Christ through observing and honoring the depth of our own human experience. We know that same Christ. We have knowledge. We have intimate knowledge of Jesus Christ. And not because we walked the earth with him, but because of the experience that we've each had. And so what Jesus was doing in that moment when he's saying to Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Then I need you to tend to all of these people that are here. I need you to tend to this land, to this ocean. I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to watch over my creation. Because remember in Matthew, Jesus said to them, give them food and shelter and clothing. Visit them when they're in jail or in the hospital, sick. And whatever you've done for these people, you've done for me. And Jesus was telling Peter in that moment, Tag, you're it, buddy. You're it. I got to go. I got to get back to doing what I was doing before you could see me. And so you now, Peter, and all of you here gathered, you're my body now. And he breathed onto them again, and he, he, he gave himself to them again in that meal. We're going to have communion today, where we take the body and the blood of Christ and we ingest it into ourselves. It's not actual flesh and blood. It's our experience of the risen Christ. And just like, just like Jesus said to Peter on that day, it's you now. You're the body of Christ. Today, when we take in these elements, we're remembering we are the body of Christ. Because you need bodies to tend to the flock of Jesus Christ. People need more than just an experience with the risen Savior. Sometimes people need groceries. And Amazon's pretty good, but I'm not sure God has an Amazon account. Sometimes people need God made flesh through us when their lives have been devastated by illness. Sometimes people need God made flesh like us, when they get a new diagnosis that they weren't expecting. Sometimes people made, need God made flesh like us when they watch us from Idaho week after week after week and they just want to be a part of this. And so they got to come down here and shake some hands and hug some necks. And we love that.
We are those bodies, assured in our faith and committed to our belief that God came to us in flesh and then remains with us in our fleshly bodies. There's a poem I read while I was getting ready for this sermon. It says, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Because you see, folks, the body of Christ shows up when people are hungry and when they need clothes and when they need shelter and when they need comfort. But you know what else? The body of Christ also shows up when the pews need vacuuming and the altar rail needs to be dusted. The body of Christ mows the grass around here and trims the trees and rakes the leaves. The body of Christ cares for the blessings that God has given us. The body of Christ stuffs little Easter eggs full of candy and hides them for kids to find on Sunday morning. The body of Christ plays the piano and the organ and sings for us. Did you know you had the vocal cords of Jesus Christ? Both of you. Where's Blake? The vocal cords of the risen Savior reside in you, and what you do feeds this body. The body of Christ prepared the church for years. And then the body of Christ shows up afterwards to clean up that fellowship mess. <laughs> Hopefully, a lot of the body of Christ shows up. The body of Christ washes dishes and takes out the trash. The body of Christ does the work of God and is oblivious to the obstacles that exist. And my job as a pastor is to be the body of Christ in your lives. But lately, I've needed you to be the body of Christ in mine. Because you're also the body of Christ. Not just me. You're ordained to be the body of Christ in the life of others. And all of us together, we're the body of Christ, watching out for each other, praying for each other, loving each other. And what would we do with our bodies if we were continually aware that this is the body of Christ. I hope God likes ribeyes. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Would we stop before we put things into our body that aren't healthy? If we remembered this is the body of Christ. Paul tells us later on, we're the temple. This is the temple. Would we change the way we approach every day if we got up in the morning recognizing that we're the body of Christ? Would we do something different? Pray with me, please. God of the new fire and feasting at daybreak, come to us in the dullness of routine and the pain of betrayal. Call to us in the way of the cross and the joy of resurrection through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen.